thank you for staying the distance. We will try to make this as uh, anecdote and fun fact rich as possible as a reward for, uh, for those who stayed with us until, uh, until this afternoon. Uh, probably today on the stage we have how many years combined of experience in race, course, management and design? When Chris started with saying stand up and sit down by age, yeah. there's a couple of us here that never managed to get up in time, let alone <laughs> anything else. No, no, I'm, I'm blessed to be a, a able to call Nori and, and Dave friends and Jakob Bosk, given that Jakob is my line manager. This will, I also believe that this will be, given that we are being recorded and uh, going live on YouTube, will be beautiful content for our e-learning platform, given that we will be talking about course measurement, which is a, a hot topic right now, Nori uh, and Jakob. Uh, we titled this session's Creative Narratives Through Course Design, and I would like to start with Jakob. Jakob, what do, you, what do we mean by creative narratives through selection of race courses, in road but also in off-road? Yes, so we, we, in my opinion, we tend to at times forget uh, who we're doing it for and, and when we start working out the details. So in many ways, uh, in principle, every race should be able to answer a very simple question. Why? Why do we have this race? Uh, why does it matter? So we at World Athletics, we compute 14,000 competitions on an annual basis. So why do we need an, another one, right? We simply don't need it. So my key question, and I've asked you that a number of times, why should I care? Yeah. Well, that's in, in my opinion, that's the responsibility of any organizer to be able to explain to the general public, because we're using their space, why should they care? That's to me, is the narrative of, this, of whatever event you're mm -hmm. putting on. Uh, when they say, why should we care? You should say, because, and then you'll have your storyline afterwards. A hundred percent. I think, I think you hit on what started this morning with what's the purpose? And every race and every race organizer needs to know what are they trying to achieve with the race? And once you've got that, you then say, well, the very core of any event is the technical aspect of the race. And what is a race? A race is a performance, and that is a set distance with credible accuracy and a time. And then you come to the course, and everything comes from the course, in my mind, everything. That's your starting point. If you don't have the course and you don't know why you've chosen that course, it doesn't work. Uh, Dave, the answer to the question that Nori just asked, what are we trying to achieve? That changes over time. And I'm looking at you, uh, and I, the picture that comes to my mind is you measuring the uh, Olympic course of the Sydney 2000 Olympics. Uh, now there is a lot of talking about the, the Paris 20, 2024 uh, marathon course. Clearly two very different products. Let's start with Sydney. What were you trying to achieve in Sydney? What was the goal, the mandate that you were given back then? And how did you respond to this, uh, to this question by designing the race course? Um, well, I was lucky enough to be the, the course designer for the Sydney Olympic marathon. And one of the primary things was to showcase the city but we also wanted to finish in the Olympic Stadium and make it the final event of the Olympics. And I think that's an important thing that we're in danger of losing our status at the Olympic Games, where the marathon, athletics is the, the premier sport, the marathon is the premier event in, in the sport, and we've had this great history where we've been able to run into the stadium as the final event and then move on to the closing ceremony. We were able to do that in Sydney. Um, you know, I was, uh, you know, have a great relationship with the people at the London Marathon events, and I had many discussions with them over the London Olympic course because it was a, a multi lap course. And I think, you know, one of the reasons they did that was to try and um, allow spectators to see that the marathon is at least four times as they, they looped around the city. But to me, an Olympic marathon course should showcase 42 kilometres, 26 miles of city streets. We proved in Sydney uh, that you can actually fill that with spectators for the whole route. You know, it was one of our concerns leading into the Olympics is Australia, we're not known for spectating at running events and we were concerned, but it was, you know, we were just blown away by the massive number of people out on that course. So I think you know, London lost an opportunity there by having 
that, that lap course. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I, I think we've got to uh, keep in mind, we, we've got to keep some mystique about the marathon. And, um, you know, I, I see uh, photographs of, you know, lines of people climbing Mount Everest. So is Mount Everest now the same challenge it was when Sir Edmund Hillary climbed it back in the 1950s? Uh, we've got to be careful we don't make it look as though the marathon is too easy. And I like to have... Um, I like the idea of point-to-point -point courses. One of the... Uh, we get tied up in, in rules and, and whatever, and I, I think uh, we've got two rules for world records, separation and, and elevation. And I think that's, in some respects, it, it is... Uh, a handicap to, to course design. Um, I do quite a bit of, well, can, well, I do a lot of measurement throughout Asia, so I do some consulting with races, and when new races are starting up, so many of them come to me and say, oh, we've got to not have an excessive drop and we've got to not have excessive separation. And I say, well, no, that's not necessary. That really only applies if you're looking for records. And, if you walk out onto the streets in any Southeast Asian place, like Bangkok, you're not going to break a world record here. Doesn't matter you know, what time of the year you run, you're not going to break a world record. So don't worry about those criteria. Design an interesting course. And you know, our two major courses, uh, historically, Athens and Boston. Um, now, we don't recognise those as, as record eligible courses but there are two most famous courses. And you know, just one interesting thing, I think, about um, Boston. I read this morning, and maybe you've all seen, that Elia Kipchoge has just announced that he's running Boston yep. next year. Now, what's going to happen if Elia Kipchoge goes to Boston, they get a tailwind, and he breaks two hours next year? What's the sport going to look like? We've already had the Vienna situation. We've had to explain how that's not a world record. Then he goes to Boston and breaks two hours. Mm. Alessio, you'll have to explain why it's not a world record. Uh, well, someone will have to explain about athletics. The, the issue is that, that there are some uh, scholars of the sport who think that even the 50% the separation rule is too generous. It should be 30%, because when done uh, in, in particular places exposed to the winds, even if you, a particular orientation of the course could, can give you an advantage even if it's, if it's 50, less than 50%. And the New York Marathon, which in the mind of many is a, is a point to point race course, according to World Athletics rules, is a, is a under 50% separation. So it's technically not a point to point course. Jacob, I saw you were nodding vigorously at the beginning when Dave was explaining his theory on uh, fast courses versus uh, meaningful courses. Yeah, so there's nothing wrong being f uh, flat, fast, and, and uh, record uh, designed course. Uh, the thing is that the very minute we leave an arena, we leave uh, a, a closed and controlled uh, environment, we go into public space. It's a blank canvas. We can literally do anything. But for whatever reason, and uh, partially because of record eligibility, we have decided that mo we will design courses in one specific way. Uh, instead of using the entire um, opportunity provided to us. Mm -hmm. So, to me, uh, we will have courses that are flat and fast, and we will have hilly courses, warm weather, cold weather, Antarctica. It's difficult to beat, isn't mm -hmm. it? Um, so, so, to me, the diversity is actually what could make and will make and has made marathon mm -hmm. and road running beautiful. I think, can I pick up on that? Every race has a story or it should have a st story. And the story either determines the course you want or determines the purpose that you're having that race. So uh, I have a course mm -hmm. which I believe will provide world records at every distance. And for instance, I'm going straight after this to go and measure a 10K it's on, on the that moon, course. It's on the moon, right? It's on the moon, right? Sorry? It's on the moon. It's on the moon, yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's in Asia. And I'm going there as a measurer to make sure I get a 9.5 meter drop. When it comes to the marathon, I can org uh, offer the organizer one uphill and three downhills. And everything else flat. And the uphill is 27 meters. That is 
a sub two course. But when it comes to Paris, the Olympics, and they've, you know, it's, a, it's the toughest course we've seen for an Olympics. It's, it's 480 meters climb compared with Athens, which is probably the next at about 300 meters. It was a 210.55, I think, for Baldini in 2004. You, you know, you, you're picking that course. That's so exciting. Jacob, you'll know far more about it, but what I see is <laughs> a 42 kilometer that goes round uh, whole of Paris, totally hilly. I can't leave my television set because I don't know that the mm -hmm. leader has gone out and will survive the course. So I've got all those people. Then you've opened up for 40,000 uh, and my entry, take my entry now, 40,000 mass participants. And I can see London bus type tours going round that course 10 years after the marathon. So what was the objective? Mm -hmm. the, you know, the objective was get road running out there, get, I presume. But can you maybe what, tell what was us the more about Paris? it? Yeah. What was the purpose of the Paris Marathon Olympics design? So, in fact, that was the, it, there is a lesson to be learned in many ways because the very first discussions we had was not on course designs or location of start and finish, which often would be the case. It was about uh, what kind of story. Uh, and Paris, they said, yeah, we'd like to celebrate the Women's March. And for those who do not know, that in, to a certain extent was the, what started, triggered the uh, French Revolution. And I was sort of like, Yes, that's a way to finish off the Olympic Games. Let's do a race inspired by a revolution. Let's do it. Um, so that was the idea. Let's, let's trace the, uh, the path followed by the French women as they walked to Versailles to protest. Um, so we went there on a side visit, um, and, and it turned out that there was quite a hill. Uh, and we had discussions, but then again, uh, going back to fast and flat, we all know that if a course is fast and flat, we kind of know who's going to win. Uh, but throwing in a hill, or as it is too, um, sort of makes it interesting. So mm -hmm. even the core question, if you have someone, when we're speaking about the elite race, if you say, this should be interesting to me, then you're onto something. Because that's what it is. We want people mm -hmm. to watch. We want the people to say, this is a cannot miss race. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think uh, I'm biased, obviously, but I think the course uh, definitely caters to that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we, that's going to be a very interesting race as I see it. But I think it's given more than that because, I mean, Paris now has two marathons that will automatically fill up for years, one in April and the other one in the autumn season. I think there's, there's so much. And when you come to the finish, um, you've got in the afternoon 40,000 runners ready for uh, the closing ceremony. So I'm expecting something huge in the closing ceremony using those uh, people that you've just brought mm -hmm. along. So I think this is the most exciting announcement out and it's not world record and as you say, Kipchoge, will he win? Is he the greatest marathon runner we've ever had? Paris will be a, a determinant. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree, and I think uh, the, the, the Paris Marathon, we're here talking about creating narratives. Well, you know, there is the narrative going back to the, the revolution and whatever. That's great. And as Nori said, it's going to create a, a, a more interesting race than we have seen in, in an Olympics for a long time. So uh, mm -hmm. full, full credit to... Uh, yeah, the people that came up with, with that concept. I think there's another, another aspect. You had the Olympics in Sydney, right? And you had the course that you say you designed to let people see Sydney. Now, Sydney Marathon, we know, is Abbott major uh, candidate, I think. And uh, it's changed its course. Why? If that was the optimum, and circumstances change. So as your race evolves, there can be more restrictions or there can be more opportunities. And I think Wayne's probably gone through a fair amount of restrictions because he's not the Olympics, but he's now moving back towards how the race evolves out. Mm -hmm. yeah. no, that, that, that's 100% correct and, and Wayne has left, but uh, 
after the Olympics in 2000, the early years of the, the, the Sydney Marathon or the current Sydney Marathon started as a legacy of the Olympic Games. So uh, the, the, um, the city of Sydney gave the event to Athletics Australia and uh, Wayne now organises it on, on, on their behalf. Um, where was I going with that? Uh, Sorry, I just lost my train of no, thought. No worries. Uh, just uh, given that you're technical experts, assuming that yes. you receive the mandate no. of designing a race course that has to cater at the same time to, let's say, the spectator sport side of it, of, of it the TV, as well as to the, to, to the mass yeah. runners, where would you start? How do you design it? Very first question is go to the organizer and say, what are you trying to achieve? If you don't know what you're trying to achieve, you have to help that race organizer. And often they will have a route. I mean, I work a lot in Africa and there are huge restrictions. And I don't think many people actually understand the sort of restrictions where you have a city with villages outside and there's one road. And you can't close that road all day. So you've got to find innovative ways around. Once you've gone around that route and measured, often you see the potential to talk to the race organizer and say, do you realize you've just passed every embassy or every consulate? Or um, this is such a great route because in Mauritius, you're, you've got such phenomenal views. Or uh, the Mandela Marathon in South Africa, uh, starts at the hall where he made his last public speech and it goes up to a horrendous hill which I called Struggle Hill having climbed it on the bike and then through Challenge Hill which the whole story of his life is in there and it finishes at the capture site. Well, you're not going to go for a flat fast course to celebrate Mandela. You know, you're going to go for this sort mm -hmm. of course. So you lead these ideas to the uh, to the organizers if he hasn't got it mm -hmm. and then you make it technically correct because I come back the success of your event is based around the credibility of the technical aspects and once you've got that right you can build whatever you want on it and you can do your sports tourism mm -hmm. and you can bring in all the different photographs and so on and so forth but the course is actually the base of mm -hmm. any event. Yeah, we often say, referring to, to trail and cross country, that it's a landscape-based sport. But if you think about it, even road races can be a landscape, an urban scape-based sport. Yeah. Uh, Nori, tell me uh, some anecdotes from your experience, times in which you had to really go against the race organizer who wanted to do certain things, wanted the race to pass through certain areas of the city, you didn't think it was a good idea for whichever reason. How do you, com and I know you've done this a lot, how do you convince them to change their mind? Well, normally, again, it's a technical aspect that you're saying to them, this won't work, you know? I mean, uh, <laughs> You're going to find an interesting start if you're running the marathon uh, yeah. next week. And we came to a sort of understanding on it. But uh, uh, on Sunday, the marathon starts in a track and goes through a very narrow gate. Now, it's possible. Why? Because you send them off in waves. So you're looking for solutions all the time. And, and you know, you can't tell a race organizer you can't do this course. But... Um, a recent one, actually it's a very potentially great one, a recent one is in Botswana. Now it's at the top of Botswana and there are four countries. Um, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe and Zambia. And it goes across a bridge into these. And, and that is a major tourist and safari area. But the design he had given me uh, meant that the runners were crossing over each other. And so we had to just take a few changes and so on and so forth to make it work. So you do that mm -hmm. sort of thing. You're there to help the organizer get the best out of it. Mm -hmm. And I think as technical officials, we're there to help athletes do a performance. We're not there to stop them. We're there to assist them in doing the performance. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I find the, the bottom, normally um, 
when I come to measure a race. Uh, I haven't been consulted about the course beforehand. And I, I try and have some input while I'm here. But basically I say, well, look, I can measure whatever you put in front of me. I, I can measure it. But the test is that normally I am back 12 months later measuring a different course. And 12 months later measuring a different course. Whereas I think the truly great marathons in the world mm. are things like the New York City Marathon that's been through the five, the five boroughs uh, ever since 1976. The course has barely changed. Uh, the, the London Marathon pretty much got their course right. They've, they've changed the finish a few times over the years, but that's pretty much been the same course for 40 years. Uh, whereas a lot of the courses I see in this part of the world, the organisers are continually changing the course. Uh, sometimes that, that may be good, because I'm, I'm getting some organisers in, in Southeast Asia who say the runners want a change. They don't want to run okay, the same course each year. So I, I guess that's coming from the local runners. If, if, you, if your marathon is based mainly on local runners, the local runners may want mm. to change. But I don't think anybody in the world wants to see you know, the great traditional marathons, New York City, London, the Athens Marathon, the Boston Marathon, they don't want to see a course change. Well, also because you're competing against your own performance or performance recorded by other people on the same course. Uh, remind me, when, when is the, we introduced the world record in the marathon? There wasn't, when did the world athletics introduce the actual world record in the marathon? That wasn't that many decades ago. It was maybe 15 or 20 years ago. In it, before, there used to be the world best performances, right? Yeah. So if you, make, yeah, if you make courses comparable, performances comparable to one another, uh, but as I'm talking, it may make sense to make performances within the same race comparable uh, uh, between years. Uh, one thing that really strikes me is the difference, the typically difference in course design that you find between um, places in which running has been there, running events have been there for decades versus up and coming running markets, the Middle East, some Asian countries. Here, my impression is, you tell me what you think about it, my impression is that it's mainly uh, uh, more often than not, they are outside of the city center. More often than not, the, the little alleys, which at our latitudes, at least in Europe, uh, are considered uh, pluses to the course. They are considered minuses. So they tend to go on, uh, on highway, on causeways, on uh, places where maybe from, uh, from a course management standpoint it's easier, or maybe just runners like it more. What do you think, if you have an opinion on this? I don't think there's a single right or wrong in this. I would say that the more intimate a race experience becomes, the better it works. Um, mm -hmm. as, an, as a participant and on broadcast. Uh, what you would see often is that at times, especially during championships races actually, because they want to show the grandeur of the city, they sort of take a boulevard, like eight lane boulevard, and it just clears it entirely of traffic, etc. Which means that during the race, you will have a single leading athlete all by him or herself. And that just doesn't work, uh, neither for the athlete or for, mm -hmm. for broadcast, right? What you want, you want spectators there screaming, mm -hmm. shouting, like uh, Tour de France, hilltop finish, stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? That's what you want to see. Uh, so I think um, it's not only about course design, it's about experience design. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are tangible assets, of course, uh, in Paris. Yes, you'll go past the Eiffel Tower. Yes, that's sort of you have to. But essentially, what you really, if you want to make this right, you should never forget the intangible assets. And that, for instance, the color run, uh, which is we all, I'm sure we're all familiar with. The success of the color run was not based on the course design. The course was irrelevant. Yes, it was based on course experience. So I think there are tangible and intangible mm -hmm. assets that need to be considered when doing this. And just one thing that I'd like a point that may be irrelevant is actually, so as of today, if I'm not mistaken, we have had 1,700 people doing the dream mile. Mm -hmm. 1,700. We've had three times as many climbing Mount Everest, mm -hmm. right? So nevertheless, what's the best dinner table conversation topic? I just did Mount Everest, or I just ran 359 in the mile. Depends and even, even saying, oh, I nearly made it, yeah. right? I nearly yeah. made it through a mile. Well, yeah, okay, yeah. I nearly made it to the top of Mount Everest. So essentially, any course, any race should actually, not, not literally, but figuratively, at least have their mountain 
what's the dinner table conversation item? Coloron, they did an amazing job at this. And so are a lot of these guys doing. Uh, so essentially, to me, that's what is about tangible and intangible. And, and in Paris, and the mountain is quite literal, quite physical. Well, talking of mountains, I mean, you, you were involved with organizing the cross country. In, and I mean, to take it up the museum, that was special. What's special about the color run? You know, it's the experience and so on. Mm -hmm. And I think this discussion over the last two days has also said, uh, we've got a changing runner base, the mass runner base. What are the youngsters looking for? And they want something different, you know? And, and I think we've got to build that in, do the, do the unusual things in the course design while still satisfying the needs of the club runner mm -hmm. or the dedicated runner, whatever. You, so you need that mix and match and you've got to be innovative. And if we're going to change, which we've all agreed we're going to do, then we need to be really innovative with the course design. Speaking of doing things differently, um, I've, I'm, I'm the race director of the Great Wall Marathon. If it gets held again, uh, when we get back to China, uh, Great Wall Marathon, obviously a very tough, difficult course, 5,164 steps. But we used to uh, have a little bit of friction with the Federation in China because we used to get more international runners coming to run the Great Wall Marathon than they would get to run the Beijing Marathon on a billiard table flat course. So it shows that you can promote challenging courses and get the benefits from that, uh, uh, particularly when you're talking about sports tourism. You know, people will travel to China to run the Great Wall Marathon, but they're less inclined to travel to run the Shanghai or Beijing marathons. Mm -hmm. uh, point blank question, and you can decline to answer. For Olympics and major championships, do you prefer to finish in the stadium or outside the stadium? Tuck, tuck. Yeah, there's a, there's, it depends on where you're going to No, but I want to know yeah. what you think. No, but I'm saying it depends on where you go. If, if it's a phenomenal stadium, we've got a, a stadium in Durban, South Africa, where there is a big swing. You know these big swings. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what you could do for the finish? Huh? Seb Coe doing a big swing into <laughs> the stadium. You know, to, so it depends on what you're trying to achieve always. I, I think we just don't think big enough and wide enough and wild enough. So a street finish for me is where, in fact, I'm trying to convince comrades, some of you will know comrades, 20,000 uh, runners doing 90 Ks. And I'm actively trying to say to them, do not finish in a stadium. You can't grow this event. If you're in a street, you can grow that event as much as you want. And you just move the the fencing to give you the vol volume you require. So, mm. horses for courses. Um, Olympics, world champs are only, what, 80 to 100 people at a time. How do you make that interesting? And I think that's, that's the key thing. France have done it. Well, my, my answer is, finish it where the closing ceremony is. And I think possibly in, in Paris, the closing ceremony might be out on the on the river, on the Seine, or, or is that just the opening ceremony? But wherever, wherever the closing know. ceremony is, as I said in my earlier remarks, keep our sport as the number one sport in the Olympics, the marathon the number one event, and if we have an opportunity to finish it at the closing ceremony, stick with it. Usain mm -hmm. Bull disagrees with you, by the way. Is, is, are you clear to answer? Yeah, of course. H how do you top the 2004 Olympic marathon finish uh, in the 1896 Olympic Stadium? To me, that, that's epic. Uh, but I would say that if you have the right, the right landscape, again, to go outside stadium, because in principle, I do believe championship running should finish in the stadium. However, 1960 Olympics in Rome, finishing Gosh. under the Arch of Constantine, Constantine. Uh, at the Colosseum, how do you top that? I mean, to me, and in Paris, uh, it, it didn't, we didn't have the uh, sufficient distance, but finishing under the Arche de Triomphe is also, mm. I mean, that's difficult to top, yep. right? Yep. So if you have the right, um, the right assets, fine. 
Perfect. Uh, I have been meaning to talk about off-road running. Our time is up, but you gave me a perfect segue to introduce the next and last speaker of the day, who will be talking about the, the one marathon where the race course, and particularly the finish, is the absolute star, is the Athens Marathon, which finishes in the uh, Olympic Stadium building, built for the first edition of the Olympics that you just mentioned. Thank you for your time today, and I hope you found this interesting. We're always available for any you know, offline conversations. Nori, Dave, and Jacob and I are passionate about this. I think it shows, and we're always very happy to engage in, in the discussions around this topic. Thank you, and over to uh, Sotiris. Thank you.